Next up, my friend Mitch Horowitz. Mitch is a historian of alternative spirituality and one of today's most literate voices of esoterica, mysticism, and the occult. He worked in, uh, for many years in publishing, including as a vice president at uh, Penguin Random House, where he was editor-in-chief at Tarcher, where I used to work. Um, Mitch is a writer in residence at the New York Public Library and the award-winning author of four books, including The Miracle Habits, and my favorite, Occult America. Uh, he's here today to tell us about ESP. Thank you all very much. Um, like many of you, I'm really delighted to be here. This has been such an extraordinary two days. The intellectual quality of the exchanges have just been remarkable. And like many of you, I'm really struck by the conviviality of all the participants. And I think that that is a direct reflection of the event's organizers. So I'd like to give a hand to them, please. The name of my brief presentation this morning is ESP, Case Closed. ESP exists. If you've been reading Wikipedia lately, you have great cause to doubt me. In fact, if you've been reading any of the mainstream literature around ESP research or the first five or 10 results that come up on any average Google search, and you're a journalist writing on deadline, or you are a grant-making executive at a foundation, or you are an ambitious graduate student deciding how to chart out your career in the social sciences, you have every reason to believe that that contention is completely subjective, shaky, woo-woo, dangerous, and not to be taken seriously intellectually which is why it's a wonderful topic for us to consider here at Hereticon. The great Enlightenment philosopher David Hume had a very simple formula by which to judge the validity of miracles, of things that seem to violate all common observation or natural law. And his formula was this, the countervailing arguments had to be more fantastic than the miraculous claims themselves. That if the skeptics or the critics or the disputatious voices were venturing arguments that required a more extreme leap of faith or credulity than the events, the events began to win out in terms of the weight of rationality. That, I contend, is exactly the place that our culture is in right now in the 21st century with regard to ESP research. And to illustrate that, I want to highlight three significant chapters in academically based, clinically based ESP research in this country going back to the 1930s. These are not the only chapters. My colleague, John Valentino, who has done wonderful work at the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab is going to talk about another chapter as well, following me. But let me stick with these three major milestones. The first goes back to the early 1930s, when a brilliant scientist, psychologist, trained botanist, and statistician named J.B. Ryan, who is an intellectual hero to me, founded the Parapsychology Lab at Duke University around 1930. J.B. was very interested in, dev in devising simple, repeatable methods that could test for anomalous transfers of information in laboratory settings. So he and a colleague came up with a five-suit deck of cards called Zener cards. Some of you may recall seeing these lovingly lampooned at the beginning of the Ghostbusters movie, where. Bill Murray was holding up these cards with circles or squares or wavy lines and shocking somebody based on whether or not he had gotten a correct hit on the cards. So you have a five-suit deck of cards, and if you're making guesses 
at which card is going to randomly come up next. Obviously, over time, you have a, a one in five uh, chance of getting a correct hit, a 20% guess rate. JB ran thousands, then tens of thousands, then hundreds of thousands of trials with his colleagues at the Duke Parapsychology Labs from 1930 to 1934. And he found that if you pooled and meta-analyzed the data, and the term meta-analysis was not even coined until 1976, JB was one of the first people in the social sciences to perform what we now routinely refer to as a meta-analysis. You would find results that didn't look like Zeus throwing lightning bolts down to Earth, but you would find then rather than a 20% hit rate, which you would expect over extended periods of time, people were scoring 25%, 26%, 27%, 28%. -28%. And this effect was persistent and constant, and it wouldn't go away and it simply shouldn't have been there. And critics, of whom there were many, and rightly so, scrutinized and criticized JB's methodology. These results violate all understood observation and circumstance, so there has to be something wrong with them. And JB practiced absolute and total transparency. He opened up his lab and his data to critics of every sort, both those who were earnest and well-intentioned and both those who were absolutely hell-bent on partisanship. And he continued to refine his experiments, refine his experiments, and this is very important that I wanna point this out very, very clearly. He reported every set. There was nothing left behind in the so-called file drawer. In fact, at that time in the social sciences, it was common practice in this country for social scientists to withhold their bad sets, withhold their zero sets on the fallacious justification that there must have been something wrong with the methodology. There was an acceptance of publication bias and JB was a pioneer in overturning that practice in the social sciences in general. He exposed every single set and again and again and again, he got these few percentage points of deviation, these few percentage points of deviation in meta-analyzed data. He released a monograph in 1934 called Extrasensory Perception, ESP. He was the person who turned that into a, a household term. And the scientific community responded as it should by raking over and scrutinizing these results because they violated all commonly understood laws of mechanics and psychology and sensory experience. There were 60 critical articles published by 40 different authors in leading mainstream psychology literature. There were 50 tests performed by different scientists over a period of about four to five years that sought to replicate JB's results. Of those 50 tests, of those 50 rerunning of JB's trials with thousands of subjects, 33 were at laboratories outside of Duke, 33 were performed by scientists who had no vested interest in proving or affirming J.B. Rhine's data. And of those 33 experiments that were run outside of Duke, 61% were confirming of his data. 61% were confirming of his data. If you go on Wikipedia right now, Pull out, well, don't pull out your phone right now. Wait, <laughs> wait until lunch or what have you. If you pull out your phone and you look up Zenner card experiments, you will read, 
that these things have never been replicated and were pockmarked by methodological failure without sourcing, something that would get red flagged on any other article on Wikipedia. The confusion that gets hatched by the repetition that these experiments were methodologically flawed or that they eluded repetition is so extreme that by the 1970s, most members of the Parapsychological Association, which is the professional grouping of parapsychologists, they believed that JB's results had never been validated. And it took a whole new meta-analysis in 1975. I mean, here we are, you know, almost 50 years later, and his own colleagues were of the belief that this data had never been replicated. And I understand how that happens, because I care deeply about ESP research. It's obvious from listening to me that I'm an advocate of ESP research, and I too have made the same mistake looking at experiments in our own time, in our own era, one of which I'll get to in just a little bit, where as someone who writes with critical sympathy on these topics, I thought there were current experiments, recent experiments that had never been replicated because the information as it's presented publicly, as it's presented journalistically, as it's presented through our primary reference sources, is so obfus obfuscated, is so partisan, that it sows confusion across our intellectual culture. Let me jump to chapter two. There was a young man, a scientist, named Charles Onerton, who was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, and he regarded J.B. Ryan as a kind of intellectual hero, as I do. And Onerton read all the books on parapsychology in his local library growing up in St. Paul. And one of his uh, grade school teachers said, well, why don't you write a letter to this guy, J.B. Ryan? So he did, and they started corresponding when Onerton was just 13 years old. And at age 15, J.B. invited uh, Onerton to come and serve a summer internship at his lab. And in a certain sense, the two never really got on personally all that well because Onerton was very interested for testing for the ESP effect or a telepathic effect under conditions of hypnosis, which wasn't something JB was particularly interested in. So he branched off on his own. And in the 1970s and 80s, and I, I speak with emotion about Charles Onerton, as you can probably tell, because he died at a very young age. He had struggled with lifelong health issues, and he died of heart failure at age 46 in 1992. It was a terrible loss to the field, and as I'll try to demonstrate briefly, it was to the field of parapsychology as great a loss as it would have been to the field of physics if Einstein had died just as he was devising his theories of relativity. Uh, J.B., um, I'm sorry, Onerton, in the 1970s and 80s, devised a series of experiments for telepathy called the Gansfeld experiments. Gansfeld is German for open field. And Onerton made the supposition that maybe, maybe it would be possible to spike an ESP effect if the individual subject could be placed in conditions of kind of a waking hypnosis, a very relaxed sensory deprived state like what you experience when you go into uh, a Depro tank. So people might be seated in some sort of an easy chair uh, fitted with uh, earphones that emit white noise in a dimly lit room fitted with eye shades. So the idea is you want to kind of clean out excess sensory data. So Onerton in these Gunsfeld experiments would seat subjects in a, a kind of a Depro tank and they were called the receiver. And then there was a subject seated outside the Depro tank and that person was called the sender. And that person would make an effort to, and I'm speaking metaphorically, to transmit uh, an image to the person seated in the Depro tank. And that person would select from, or have selected for him or her, one of four images. So again, if you're operating on guesses, over time, you have about a 25% chance of getting it right. And Onerton found that again, over the course of thousands of thousands of trials, 
in different labs, different nations, different universities in these settings, instead of scoring an average hit rate of 25%, the pooled data was showing hit rates of between 32 and 38%, a higher percentage than what J.B. Ryan was getting on the Zener card experiments. And again, it's important to understand, I mean, we're talking about a few points of deviation here. This is not the you know, Red Sea parting. A few points of deviation, but consistent and constant over years and years of replication, experiment, refinement, and the Gonsfeld experiments attracted a great deal of controversy because this data was showing a really persistent, statistically significant deviation. And critics who were very concerned about this kind of research going on at respected universities and hospitals, uh, Honerton ran a parapsychology lab at Maimonides Medical Center in my hometown of Brooklyn, New York, uh, they really descended on this data. And a remarkable signature event occurred that has never repeated. Honerton got together with one of the most prominent skeptics of ESP research, a psychologist from the University of Oregon named Ray Hyman, who's still living. And they decided in 1986 that they were going to review and meta-analyze all the data together, and they were going to issue a joint communique. So Honerton and Hyman meta-analyzed all these various different studies. There were about 42 studies of which Honerton felt 28 really stood up to the standard of methodological excellence. Out of the 28, 23 were confirming of his results. 23 out of 28 of the most stringently analyzed juried studies were confirming his results. So the two of them wrote a joint communique in 1986. And what they said was, we disagree on the nature of what's happening here. I, Honerton, am an advocate of the ESP thesis. Ray Hyman rejects the ESP thesis. But we both agree that the data is uncorrupted, unpolluted, valid, demonstrates great improvements over some of the earlier experiments, and we are seeing a statistically significant result of anomalous transfer of information in a laboratory setting, and it warrants further research. Isn't this what's completely missing from our culture at this instant today? You know, this is what was reflected in, in what our friends were discussing about the Westboro Baptist Church. It's not necessary that a critic agree with the ESP thesis. It's only necessary to say, I acknowledge the validity of the data and it's warranting of a further question. And yet this signature moment, now it goes back a generation, 1986, you know, it's never been repeated. It's never been repeated because when people who are on tenure track or in positions where they have to solicit grants or obviously, you know, just doing things that are necessary to preserve one's reputation in the social sciences, as soon as they begin that kind of collaborative effort, they're smeared as believing in fairy dust, nonsense. In fact, again, if you pull out your phone and go on to Wikipedia, you will find, I think in the first sentence of the article on the Gonsfeld experiments, they are described as pseudo-science without sourcing, without sourcing. And one wonders why these ideas cannot get a hearing. What is science other than methodological replicability? What is it? And that's what the Gonsfeld experiments did. That's what the Gonsfeld experiments did. Through methodological replication, heavily juried, analyzed freshly by an arch 
skeptic of the data and the leading designer of these experiments, they came to the conclusion that a statistical anomaly exists and requires further research. If that's pseudoscience, then that term has lost its meaning. But that's what you'll find in the primary reference sources. Now, I mentioned earlier that even people who are steeped in this material professionally, even people who care very deeply about the perpetuation of ESP research, find the mainstream reference sources so obfuscating that it can be difficult to even follow the field when you are a critical advocate of it, as I am. And this happened to me. In 2011, uh, a research psychologist at Cornell University named Daryl Bem published a paper in a very prominent American psychological journal in which he reported on a radical series of nine experiments that he had conducted, which included experimentation for precognition. Precognition. As soon as you use that term, it starts sounding like you're getting into crystal ball territory. You know, everybody's warning buzzer goes off. This is science fiction. This isn't stuff that we're supposed to participate in on a university setting. Well, what Bem did in this very innovative series of experiments, which consisted of nine different experiments that he conducted over a period of about 10 years, in short, in short, was that he found that if he asked people to perform a simple exercise of memorization of words in a list, their memorization rates would spike if they studied the list, if they studied the list with the intent of memorizing it in the near future, in the near future. It violates all commonly observed, commonly understood cognitive experience. And yet he ran these tests over and over and over with thousands of subjects in conditions that he strived to make as methodologically rigorous and as transparent as possible. And he continually found what might be called this retrocausal effect, that memorization in the future seem to spike cognitive recall in what we call the present. And he published this in a journal, and there was absolute outrage over this. How could this have been allowed in? This is an embarrassment to the entire field. In fact, perhaps it's not even real. Perhaps this is a satire. Perhaps this is Bem's version of Jonathan Swift's modest proposal, where he's trying to point up holes in the scientific model. No one could believe it. Now dig this. There was a story in 2015 in the New York Times about a spate of fraud cases and retracted studies that were sweeping through the social sciences. And in the first paragraph, the lead paragraph of the article, the reporter pointed out, well, there's been this fraud, there's been that fraud, there's been this retraction, and a major psychology journal published a paper on precognition, which hyperlinked to Bem's study. Not once in the article did the reporter refer back to Bem's study. There was no justification of having lumped it with polluted data. So at the time, the newspaper maintained an editorial ombudsman. I wrote to her. I got no response. I wrote a letter to the editor. I got no response. I've written for the New York Times myself. In fact, quite recent to that article, I had just written a piece for the Times about the crisis of uh, worldwide violence against people accused of witchcraft. So I wasn't a stranger to its pages, and I couldn't get a single hearing. And one year after Ben's experiments, there were a group of critics who, I would say, rushed into print. I mean, a year is a pretty short time to replicate experiments of this nature a version of their own experiments, and they said, well, Bem's uh, thesis fails. Uh, we, we, we retread three of his trials, and they failed. What the critics didn't reveal, what the critics didn't reveal is that they had pre-registered 
their experiments and they created an open source database and they said, look, in the interest of disclosure, we want anybody else, any other scientists who have replicated these experiments to, to, to contribute their results to our open source database and we will report the results. They received three responses. Two of the three responses replicated BEM's results and they didn't appear in the article. They didn't appear in the article. And BEM, naturally, wrote these critics and said, hey, you had two responses in your own database. Based on your own rules of the road, you're supposed to be reporting this stuff. Wh why wasn't this in your article? And what was the response? The same kind of gear grinding responses that makes these debates impossible. They completely sidestepped his question and said, oh yeah, well you had a trial you didn't report. And you know, that's why we can never get to a place of integral debate over these things. They completely sidestepped it. However, I was influenced by this. And in September of last year, I wrote an email to a good friend of mine, Dean Radin, who's a parapsychology researcher at the Institute of Noetic Sciences in Northern California. And I said, Dean, I'm writing a piece on some precognition studies. My impression is that Dem BEM's data has been too pockmarked by methodological flaws to be grouped among the core research. Am I right about that? And he wrote back very stoically, no, Dem's, BEM's data is fine. So I went and I started to research it. And this is what I discovered. BEM committed an extraordinary act of transparency after completing his studies in 2011. For free, he made available all of his data, every set, every study. He made available for free the software that he used in his experiments, and he published an instruction manual so that any scientist or researcher who wished to retread his steps could do so, free. Made it as easy as possible. There is a meta-analysis that was published several years ago in the research journal F1000, which some of you may know, and it was updated as recently as July of 2020. Here are the facts. BEM's experiments, including the original trials, have been replicated, confirmed, and rerun 90 times in 33 different laboratories in 14 different countries. Indulge me, the repetition of that figure. 90 times in 33 different labs in 14 different countries. Again, you go on Wikipedia, you will see these experiments described, Bem's original experiments described as pseudoscience that have eluded replication. Now many of you in this room are into tech, product development, venture capital. How many times do you have people coming into your office or coming to you over Zoom meetings and saying, hey, we've got this great data for you and sometimes maybe it's pretty great, sometimes maybe it's pretty good. Does it ever, does it ever rise to that scale? 90 replications? in 33 different labs in 14 different countries with total critical transparency? How many times has somebody who wants your money ever presented you with figures like that? And all of it being presented in terms of research manuals and software for free. It is so obfuscating that even I, as recently as September, was not sure whether BEM's experiments had been subject to replication. And in a way, in a way, parapsychology should of course be held to a much higher and more stringent standard because it does violate commonly observed experience. And I understand how everything within us, every empirical impulse within us wants to insist that something like precognition is not possible. I'll just leave you with this one thought. 
since the age of Einstein and experiments that have proven his theories. We know, we fully understand and know that time is conditional, that time slows down, not as a mental exercise, but literally for people who are traveling at or near light speed. And that's not just Star Trek territory. There are minute, minute reductions in aging, even among astronauts who travel at high speeds, obviously nowhere near light speed, in our own era. Time space is conditional. Linear time is, we understand this intellectually, a device that five sensory beings need to get through life. It's not an absolute. It is absolutely not an absolute. It's conditional. Are we able to catch glimpses of some kind of effect that goes outside of linear time? And if we do catch these glimpses, what are we as a generation going to do about it? Are we going to flip over the chessboard because it violates all commonly observed experience? Or are we going to do what human beings are supposed to do? Ask a question. Ask what lies around the next corner. Ask the question, who are we? We're not capable as a generation of asking the question, who are we, unless we let in this data. We have the evidence. ESP, or some anomalous transfer of information, exists in a laboratory setting. We have evidence of some non-local extrasensory transfer of information, and it demonstrates that we have a life, we have a mind, we have an intellect, we have a psyche that exceeds commonly observed episodes of cognition, motor skill, and sensory experience. And I ask us to be the generation that won't flip over the chessboard, but that will ask the question, what is out there? And I thank you all very, very much. Thank you.